वेलकम गुड मॉर्निंग एंड हेलो लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई एम मानसी एंड इट्स अ ग्रेट प्लेजर फॉर मी टू स्पेंड माय सैटरडे मॉर्निंग विद दिस ब्यूटीफुल लेडी हु हैज डॉन्ड मेनी क्रिएटिव हैट्स मिस रोनिता मुखर्जी आई लाइक टू कॉल अपॉन माय कलीग श्रेया भालिंगे टू इंट्रोड्यूस आवर गेस्ट स्पीकर मिस मुखर्जी गुड मॉर्निंग एम आई ऑडिबल बिफोर आई स्टार्ट यस Yes. Okay. Good morning to one and all. I am Shreya Bhalinge, and today it is my honor to welcome Miss Ranita Mukherjee, the ED of Lander and Fitch. Lander and Fitch is India's leading branding and advertising agency, which believes in creating a unique experience for their brands across different industries. With the help of their WPP network, they provide communication services such as advertising, public relations and affairs, data and media, digital relationship and marketing. Ms Mukherjee started her career at Lander as a client manager and has worked with some iconic brands such as Mahindra, Britannia, Mother Dairy, Titan and many more. She thrives on nurturing client relationships and is a key driver of growth of their Mumbai office says Ms Lulu Raghavan who is the MD. Ms Mukherjee is extremely zealous about writing on brands and insights and mentoring her team. She is also a mentor with WPP Stella, a program dedicated to coach young women leaders, which aims to address the barriers that could prevent women from progressing in their careers to senior levels. She is the perfect blend of optimism, curiosity, passion, creativity, and leadership. She says she is inspired by traveling. She says that the city out layouts, the people, the overall energy are distinct. that they are thriving agile ecosystems of e- infrastructure people beliefs behaviors and hopes they are brands by themselves a keen collector of insights and inspiration let us all welcome her with a virtual round of applause and now over to you ma'am wow that's that's a lot of research you would have done on me and you reminded me of a number of things that even i had forgotten so thank you very much for that thank you ma'am All right. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can I do that? Is now the right time? Okay. Yes. Yes. So let me share my screen. And while I pull up my screen, um, Momita, if you want to just guide me in terms of how much time do I have? How sh- how how should I pace myself? So uh, it's eleven o'clock. You have an hour and about an hour, and then uh, students have some questions for you as well. excellent so one hour is good let's click through um i'm not, i'm not able to see everyone because i'm sharing my screen but in case you are raising your hand or if you have a question i would love to pause and have a discussion let's make this as interactive as possible um uh, not really a monologue i think that's that's when it becomes really fun all right great um So Momita and I have been actually in touch for a long time and we we've been discussing and going back and forth with respect to what we can do for you in a way that makes Saturday morning a little bit more inspiring and exciting and we finally agreed on talking about the value of good design and how good design is actually good for the business. So I thought I'll I'll take you through uh how we think about good design the principles of good design and the tangible outcomes that companies can actually experience if they invest in good design so that's really what we are going to talk about today i'm not going to spend too much time on landor and fitch because if you go online you'll you'll hear everything but however i do want to say that we we were founded by two very iconic people So Walter Landor established Landor in 1941 um and he had famously said that products are made in the factory and brands are created in the mind and this is something that still stays with us branding is all about perceptions it's really about connecting with the hearts and the minds of the people and Rodney Fitch again a very iconic experience designer said it can only be one cheapest the rest needs design so if you use prices as a differentiator it's not going to be a competitive advantage for very very long so when both of them came together we really established landor and fitch and it was all about extraordinary brand transformation really using the power of design in the service of your business This is a video but I'm not going to play it because it gets choppy and I also want to spend more time talking to you about 
uh, everything else that I have. So let's get to that. Oh, do I have to play this? Ah, no. Um, we are the largest. We have offices across the network, and that gives us a unique advantage in terms of collaboration, working with uh, different offices, depending on what the brief is, what the opportunity is. Um, it's exciting and fun, but it also means there's absolutely no relevance when it comes to time, because you could be on a call at eight in the evening or at five in the morning. Nevertheless, it's always exciting and fun. Um, in terms of what we do, it is a full service of offerings all the way from strategy to design to experience to cultural transformation to brand management and tracking. And this is very important uh, for all of you to recognize and understand that when you think about brands, don't think about it in a linear manner. It's brand is not equal to advertising or brand is not equal to PR. There's so much more to it. And you need to have a more holistic approach to brand building. And you need to think about it in a 360 degree manner. And that's really what we offer to our clients in terms of services and offerings overall. Um, moving forward, lots of clients that we work with all the way from dairy to alcohol, to real estate, to fashion. So it's quite exciting uh, every day and one cannot really complain. Again, in terms of sectors and industries, you'll see it's a good mix uh, across and it's always fun. There's never really a dull day. So from banking to uh, snacking to um, dairy, it's, it's always quite diverse. Now, in terms of what I want to chat about, and this is very fluid. I don't want us to go by the textbook, but I have two fundamental things that uh, we want to cover. One is why good design is good business. Let's start with that argument and then we can move to fundamentals of good design. And of course, I would love to hear your views, your arguments and have a good discussion. All right. Um, so let's keep going. Now let's start with, you know, what is good design? You know, is it something that makes you happy? Is it something that uh, really, you know, enamors you? Is it something that uh, makes you imagine further? Walter Lando had said that it's actually yeah. all of these things. So Sorry, someone's watching. Right. So Walter Lando actually said that good design is something that gives you satisfaction, that makes you proud. It creates a positive response it really moves and inspires people. Of course, it needs to be appropriate for the category and ideally it needs to take all the right boxes. So taking that conversation forward, what we are really saying is that good design actually creates preference on shelf. If you have really thought through your packaging design, it can create preference on shelf. Good design creates loyalty. Um, you know, think about Apple. It's really on the foundation of good design that they've managed to expand into so many product categories and create loyalty. Good design creates desire. We all know Coke is not really good for us. We all know that that liquid inside is probably the most unhealthy thing out there. But yet, through their packaging, through their communication, they create this instinctive desire in all of us. Good design can actually inspire behavior and change behavior. So this is uh, an example of some trash cans that we uh, designed for Central Park in New York, where we realized that people were actually not disposing their trash responsibly. And we really spent a lot of time researching, observing, and we arrived at these beautiful designs for trash cans that encouraged uh, better responsible uh, recycling. So good design can actually help you change behavior. Good design definitely commands premium. That's ultimately what companies are really uh, seeking. It's, it's really about um, making money, uh, keeping shareholders happy and uh, driving growth. Uh, good design can help you differentiate from competition. Just think in a market filled with juices and juices and juices, Paper boat really managed to stand out through a very strong and clever hook. They really built on this hook of nostalgia. They re-looked at their packaging, very intelligent structural design, very intelligent communication design that actually 
helps them stand out and uniquely connect with you in a manner where you won't forget about them. Overall, when we look at research, research has very conclusively shown that good design actually help you increase your revenue and increase shareholder returns over a very progressive period of time. And of course, it varies category to category. One may argue that maybe in consumer goods or medical technology, the value of design is higher. Maybe in some sectors, it's lower. But one cannot ignore the fact that if companies invest in good design, it means positive returns overall. Also, when we looked at the design value index, and this is from a few years back, but companies that have invested in design, and you can see on the left-hand side, Apple is right on top, but other uh, significant brands as well, they have seen uh, a very progressive yield uh, over a period of 10 years. However, despite knowing that design is good for company, for businesses, companies struggle with design. And I think this is where all of you can step in and you can really shape the future of the industry. Now, what are the struggles? Number one, they don't know how to make objective de decisions. Design is not about how pretty it is or whether you like the color red or whether yellow is the perfect color or not. It has to be more objective. It has to be in service of the customer. It has to be in service of the goal or the ambition that you're pursuing. Number two, uh, design leaders also fail when you are not able to make this a very iterative process. So once again, um, increasingly with D2C brands, with digital being such a key medium, there is opportunity for us to rapidly prototype, test with users, record feedback and improvise. Design cannot be about spending years and years working in isolation and then coming up with a beautiful design and expecting the world to love it. That's simply not, not how it happens anymore. Even when we receive briefs, when we work on packaging, it's really about rapid prototyping. Come up with designs, test it with consumers, record feedback and keep uh, making incremental changes. And then finally, design leaders do not consider the customer when they're thinking of products and services. And this is also another reason why companies fail. Companies may, may set up a design cell, they may uh, hire the brightest people, but if you're not in touch with the on-ground reality and if you're designing in isolation, it's very likely that you will fail. We are leveraging design to connect more meaningfully with customers. So you have to keep the customer at the center of everything that you do. Design is largely a way of making products more attractive, but it's a lot more. And if you actually dive deeper, you'll start to see it's, it's a way of thinking. So you don't have to be a designer. You don't need to know Corel and Photoshop and Illustrator. It's really an orientation that you need to embrace and think in terms of design solutions, design thinking, in terms of human understanding and empathy. It is a driver for business success. It's the only way to stand out. Now, when you think of design, it's actually a very expansive concept. You can have product design, you can have graphic design, you can have user experience, you can have space design, you can have engineering design. And it's also very important to be focused about what is needed appropriately for the problem that you're trying to solve. You know, in the case, let's, let's talk, take banking, for example. A bank may say that they're losing out on millennial consumers. They probably don't want to bank with them. In that case, your first port of call is not to design a shiny object. Your first port of call is probably to map the customer's journey. Really put on your customer journey hat and think about the customer, profile them, think about their journey, identify the highs and lows, and then come up with a design solution. In some cases, it's really thinking about the product design. It's really thinking through how your product can tell a new and a different story. 
So what I'm saying is design is a very broad and expansive concept. And uh, it would be a little foolish to say that you know it all, but it would be wise to acknowledge that when you think of design, there's a lot that you can do appropriately keeping in mind the brief, the opportunity and the challenge. That really just summarizes the first part in terms of telling you why design is important. Would you like me to pause? Are there any questions in terms of, you know, what you took away before we move to how do you get to good design? No questions at all? Oh, Ma'am, actually, we have a Q&A session right after your presentation, so uh, you can continue. All right, that's helpful. Let's do it that way then. Yes. So essentially, in this first part, what, what I really tried to emphasize on was the need for good design and thinking about design very expansively and really thinking of design as a mindset. You don't need to have the design skills. It's really an orientation. You know, one, one of my favorite examples from business is when Indra Nui became the CEO of PepsiCo, and she was a hardcore left brain thinker, you know, the IIMs of the world and the finance background, yet she understood the need for design to really elevate Pepsi to the next level and to connect with the new generation of consumers. And she hired the brightest and the best she really began to think about new product development, packaging, shelf experience, and also internally culture and organizational development. So it really goes on to say that design, if leveraged correctly, can really help your business. And that's really where all of you come into the picture because you are going to be driving this conversation going forward, irrespective of your background. That's, that's really important. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not a designer, I'm an analyst, I'm a numbers person, I'm a business person. Design impacts all of you, all right? So that's, that's the starting point. Now the question is, if design is so important, how do we get to good design? And that's what I want to talk to you about in terms of the fundamentals of good design, all right? So moving forward, there are five fundamentals of good design, the way we think about it. There's insight, there's perception, there's ideas, there's story, and there's courage. So I'll take you through each of them. There are some lovely examples. Some you would have seen, some would be new for you, and hopefully some learnings for you as well. So let's start with insight. This is actually my favorite because I feel insight is very used and abused in our industry. Everyone loves to think that they have an insight. Everyone loves to ask where the insight is, but very often we confuse observations with insight. And I want to tell you that insight is really an acute understanding of people. It's the fundamental truth behind how people act. And more importantly, it's the why. So one of my favorite examples is, and this is from many years ago, when one of our offices in the US was working with Kraft and they basically identified this opportunity of adults snacking post dinner. And there was a lot of excitement because they had all the data and they said, 90% of adults are snacking after dinner. It's a huge opportunity for us. Let's launch products and let's really get going. But the question was, that was just an observation. You know, we just knew that people were snacking and no one really knew why. And then when we probed further and we dug a little deeper, we realized that people are snacking post dinner as a way of rewarding themselves. It was almost rewarding yourself after a day of hardships, after a day of challenges. And you wanted to treat yourself with that little snack, whether it's a cookie, whether it's an ice cream, whether it's a piece of chocolate. Now that became an insight. It's about that little treat. It's about that little reward. There's very little you can do with an observation, but there's tons that you can do when you have an insight because now you've really understood why this person is doing. 
So you can design your communication, you can design your packaging in a way where the customer will feel that, oh my God, this is really meant for me. And how did the company understand this? So like I was saying, don't confuse statistics and observations and tons of data with insights. They are not actionable. Insight observations when converted to insights actually become actionable and the snack example that I was really talking about. Another really great example, and this is a little quick case study that I'll take you through, was how companies can use insight to create differentiation. So this was a tea brand that we worked with in our London office. And this little tea brand came and said that I want to create this brand. I want to you know, uh, grow, I want to be the most preferred brand. And we really thought long and hard about how can we really uh, create differentiation, you know, because every brand was talking about provenance, you know, tea from China and tea from Asia. Every brand was talking about health benefits, you know, vitamin C, you lose weight, you gain, you know, nutrition, all of those things. So what could this new brand possibly talk about? And then, we really arrived at this key insight that good tea or a good tea drinking experience is really about patiently waiting. You need to brew the tea. You need to really patiently wait to savor that a sip of tea. And that's when we realized there was a, a, an idea that we could start to build upon where everyone's talking of instant noodles and instant coffee we actually took the other way around and we built this brand that I'm gonna show you and you'll start to see the brilliance of this. So that's uh, Wait for all of you. It's a tea brand that we created for a client in London. And with the limited budgets he had, there was no way he could have just created another brand and said the same narrative that anyone else would have said. But the moment you, you have a brand which says wait and you see it on shelf or you see online, it at least intrigues your curiosity and you you want to know more and it was really built on that little insight that we landed upon through research and through discussions so it was all about the worthwhile weight and that's how we created the brand all the way from the name to the design to the overall communication so the power of insight is really what i'm trying to uh, land uh, over here a few more examples of you know, how you can leverage insight to create brands in India. So this was Time Pass that we created a couple of years back. Once again, when you think of snacking, snacking is not because you're hungry. Snacking is not because you need the nutrition. Snacking is really that mindless moment when you just want to fill it up. It's a word that you want to fill it up. And we said, it's really Time Pass. And that's really how this entire brand was born. And 
this, when you see the design, it is really these human expressions and emotions that you see. And we realize that when people try different flavors from salty to sour to uh, lime and lemony, your visual expressions keep changing. And we really wanted to capture that through packaging and communication, really connecting with consumers and telling them about the many offers we had, the many flavors that we had. So some really cool uh, work that we did a couple of years back. So if I were to summarize this insight piece for you before I move on to the next principle, focus on the why. It's never the what, it's never what you are seeing and observing, it's really the why. And there are lots of ways of arriving at the why. Um, you, lots of ways of thinking about it. The closest you will get to it is, is by really walking in the shoes of the consumer. And that's where you know good quality research comes in. This can be through qualitative research, ethnographic research, visiting consumer homes, looking into their kitchen shelves and their bathrooms to really understand the why versus just the what. Another way of doing this, which is sometimes very helpful, is uh, ask 20 questions. So people love eating cake. Why? Because it is sweet. Why? Because it makes them happy. Why? Because they're trying to get over maybe you know a dull moment in their life. Why? Because they want to escape. Why? And you keep drilling down and down until you really arrive at that little insight that's probably hiding somewhere and people are not talking about it enough. So I always say that big data is very helpful. It really helps you get a good picture of you know, the market or consumers, but insights typically lie somewhere on the fringes. It's not the big data, it's the small data where you'll find the magic. So that's about insight. I'm gonna move on to perception. So to really do good design, it starts with insight, but now once you have the insight, what do you do with it? And that's where perception comes into the picture. Perception really lies at the root of creativity. You know, starting to see things differently is what's going to help you come up with very creative solutions. If you see what everyone else sees, and if you see what everyone is talking about, you will come up with a very seen before solution. So you need to start looking at things very differently. And you know, on the right hand side, if you just see this graphic image, you'll see a bunch of things. You'll see the sun, you'll see peacock feathers, you'll see spirals, but whoever is able to see this in the most unique and differentiated manner will be able to tell the freshest story. So another really cool example over here, and I'm just gonna click ahead, sorry, there. So this is a really cool example of perception. We were working with Kraft Mac and Cheese. It had become a very stale, old, fuddy-duddy brand, and we really had to think about refreshing them, making them cool, making them popular once again. And one of the designers was really looking at the macaroni. And everyone else thought of it as macaroni. You mix it with cheese, boil it in water, and you basically have a nice comfort meal. All the research spoke about you know, taste and fulfillment and comfort. And then we said that, hey, you know what? That little piece of macaroni is actually a smile. It actually, in a way, is the story of how comforted and happy people feel when they have a bowl of mac and cheese. And that idea of the smile really carried forward in communication in packaging the way you see it and overall the experience of the brand. It, it really became foundational to macaroni, Kraft Mac, mac and Cheese's uh, brand principle. It was about inspiring smiles. It was about creating those moments of uh, feeling good. And there's a really cool video, which I think will bring a smile to your face. Hold on. So this is what we did, a massive installation. You know you love it. We really wanted to remind people of the brand through this smile and- Happy Mother's Day, everybody. I'm Melissa Moore, author of Holy <laughs> A Brief History of Swearing. 
study by Kraft Mac and Cheese revealed that 74% of moms say they've sworn in front of their kids. If you're one of the 26% who say they've never sworn in front of their kids, you're full of Anyway, I'm here to show you how to avoid some of these not-so-perfect parenting situations. For example, when your kids are running around like caffeinated gorillas when you're trying to make a web video, you might say, what the frog? You're acting like flipping goof nuggets. Take that horse hockey outside. Instead of, calm the down and get your little outside. Or you can say, Get off your monkey flunking tablet and get your shit talky mushrooms ready for soccer practice. And you really want to say, move your get together for soccer, you're gonna be out! I meant son of a motherless goat. No parent is perfect, but sometimes you can do better. That's why I'm here. Other times you can't, and that's why there's Kraft Mac and Cheese. Sugar, I said sugar. Sometimes we just have to swear, and that's okay. Nobody's perfect. You're a mom, and it's Mother's Day. I'm Melissa Moore, and here's to swearing like a mother. Oh, poot, I almost forgot. For a special Mother's Day gift, go to swearlikeamother.com. So as you can see, this idea of a smile inspired from everyday life moments really became a driving idea. And it was all really born from seeing things differently. So once you have the insight to really activate that insight, true brilliance lies in being able to see things differently, seeing things that others are not really able to see. And it all just started with that little macaroni and, and the shape of it. So that's really for you, the idea of smile, how it was brought to life. And more importantly, how, one thing that you want to remember about perception, it's really about being able to see things differently. So we spoke about insight. We spoke about perception. Insight is the why. Perception is about seeing things differently. And now I'm going to move on to the third principle. I hope, I hope the pace is fine. I hope everyone can hear, see. All right, perfect, moving on. So ideas. I think all of us have tons of ideas and we are all brimming with ideas. We are curious, we are enthusiastic. And I think that's brilliant. However, it's, it's also about identifying the ideas that have value. It is a process. It is not very random. Very often, people tend to think that, oh, you're a creative agency, so do you just order pizza, sit around a room, brainstorm, and come up with names, and come up with ideas. And I want to tell all of you, it's not as glamorous. It's not the way you see it in films. There is a lot of rigor. There is a process to arrive at ideas that actually have value. It's not random it requires a lot of discipline. So what I'm really trying to say is ideas are super valuable. You cannot do much without a big idea. So at Landor at Fitch, we are all about idea-driven thinking. Idea is what's going to set you apart. We are living in a world which is really driven by ideas. The more unique your idea is, the more differentiated your idea is, greater your chances of success. So it's not just about ideas, but it's also about ideas that can have tangible uh, value. So spend time on this, uh, embrace the discipline and the structure that's needed to arrive at ideas, never shoot down a good idea, but don't fall in love with the first idea that you come up with. I think this happens to the best of us, we come up with an idea and we think it's the best, but chances are that's an idea you've come up with because you've seen it somewhere, heard it somewhere, read about it somewhere. So at Landor and Fitch, when we brainstorm, we have round one brainstorming where we come up with a tons of idea. And that's when people have most ideas and we write it down and we say, all right, this is going to the bin. Now let's, let's go deeper and let's see what more ideas you can come up with. And this is when people are not feeling very good. 
they don't have that many ideas but if you persevere that's when the best ideas are going to come to you um a super cool example of ideas and how ideas can help brand is when we were working with Jevalia coffee this was a swedish coffee brand that wanted to enter america and uh the coffee market in america is very very uh competitive you have starbucks you have duncan you have you know john thompson so it's not very easy and you really needed a strong idea to for this brand to stand out and for this brand to connect with people so we came up with the idea of a fika now what does a fika really mean in sweden fika is really a coffee break every time you take a coffee break you are basically you know going on a fika break and we created this whole world around fika time we encourage people to come together and fika and we said let's fika and it instantly became quite successful in terms of getting people to talk about the brand look at the brand take it off the shelf as well we didn't stop there we actually you know thought about the packaging we thought about the architecture we also said that if we are using a swedish reference over here let's go deeper let's build the sweden heritage the the loyalty in our packaging everyone else is talking about colombian coffee and south african coffee let's talk about the swedish heritage the swedish royalty and build a world around it and we created something really cool one moment in sweden we do things a bit different winters can be long and hard so we go swimming in the cold arctic waters we also have special massages uniquely swedish get in that the zipper to make it easy for you to get out of your pants we never power through the work day without taking time out to enjoy ourselves we fika fika every day fika twice fika fika once in the morning and once in the afternoon but the workplace isn't the only place that you can fika we fika when we study after skiing in a greenhouse so you might even fika with the mailman i remember my first fika i was 17 was on the kitchen counter with my au pair it didn't last very long but um so I invite you to join me in front of the fire with a cinnamon bun for a fika. Yes. What did you think I was talking about? So that's fika. That's really about the Swedish coffee break. And it was that little idea that really helped us power through and create a lot of disruption in the market shelf and stand out and that's really what brands need you don't want to be a me too brand you don't want to talk about the flavor and the taste and the provenance the way everyone else is doing um so good results for these guys when they launched some more really cool examples of work that we have done in india really based on the power of insight and idea so I'll just quickly tell you the story. This is when we started working with Mother Dairy Cheese a couple of years back. And you may know that Amul Cheese really dominates the shelf. It's 70% of the market is owned by Amul Cheese. And then of course you have a little bit of goat cheese, you have Britannia and a lot of uh, niche brands that have now come up. Unlike the West where cheese is consumed with your meal, you can have it with a cup of, you know, with a glass of wine. In India, cheese, we realized through research that mothers are actually using cheese to get their kids to eat better. So it's pav bhaji with cheese, it's paratha with cheese, it's, it's your little, you know, chapati rolled with cheese. So mothers basically use it as a bribe or a trick to get their uh, children to eat. So we were really fascinated by the story of the transformation. And we said that even the most mundane meal that your child will say no to can be transformed with just a slice of cheese, which is why we created this whole packaging and design system around transformation. So you can see the paratha and the cheese, you can see the sandwich, and 
that's really how we took the uh, overall brand refresh forward. Uh, when they launched a couple of years back, they were met with tremendous success. It for a very long time, the cheese portfolio in Mother Dairy was making the most money. And Mother Dairy themselves were very surprised because you know cheese was the smallest category in their portfolio. So what, what we are really saying is that great design actually comes from big ideas. You need to have a big idea that really can power your brand through. Now, another thing that I wanted to tell you over here is think about these ideas as a platform for action. So when you go back to Fika and, you know, which was all about a Swedish brick, it was able to inform your packaging design, your communication, your social media content. It had lots of legs to it. Even the idea of meal transformation was able to go far. So when we think of a big idea, we really think if it has legs to go on for the next couple of years. It cannot be an idea with limited relevance. It cannot be just a campaign idea where you come up with communication and then forget. It needs to be more timeless. So that's very important. But once you have that strong idea based on insight, based on a unique perspective, you've really hit gold, all right? So moving forward in terms of you know, how one can think differently. We won't do this right now, but I'm just sharing some recommendations on how you can arrive at big ideas and you can think differently. You can try it the next time you have an assignment or you're doing some group activity. Um, one way of really, uh, you know, putting on the thinking hat is think of challenger brands that you really admire. So whether it's a Twitter or an Amazon, if you still love Facebook, so maybe it's a Facebook, Instagram, whatever those brands are, and force yourself to think about what they would have done had they entered another category. So for example, if you love Amazon, and if Amazon had to get into hospitality, what would that hotel brand be like? It's a great way to start thinking differently it's a projection technique that helps you really push the limits of your thinking to arrive at insights and ideas that you can develop and take forward. Uh, we use this very often with our clients when clients are stuck uh, really thinking about their category and they, they are limited by that. They don't want to think beyond. This uh, technique really helps. So I remember a couple of years back, uh, we were working with a chicken brand, a uh, frozen chicken brand, and um, they were stuck with, you know, the learnings and the consumer behaviors and the insights that they had. And it was almost like a point of no return. They're like, Indians don't like frozen chicken. They want to go to the wet market. Uh, they will not pay more for packaged chicken. Packaged chicken is a complete no-no. And we said, okay, all right you know, what would it be like if Amazon got into chicken? Uh, you know, what do you think they would have done? And that, you know, that conversation led us to this whole idea of they would deliver super fast. They would be customer centric. So it's almost saying that if you order the chicken within 30 minutes, you will have it delivered. So it's not really frozen. It's basically fresh chicken that's really coming to you. And maybe that's going to help consumers think about packaged chicken very differently. And that, of course, led to a lot of innovation in terms of supply chain, in terms of innovation. And you can see today brands are doing that. So if you look at Alicious, which has become the poster child of packaged chicken delivery, that's exactly what they are doing. So great way to think about your business differently and to identify opportunity. All right. Um, brands are all about a great story. Uh, human beings connect with stories. Human beings will also suspend their disbelief if you tell me a good story. So all the insights, all the perspective, all the ideas that you have, they have to be packaged in a lovely story. If you don't tell me a good story, I will lose interest. Human beings 
are not that swayed by data and numbers as much as they are through a good story. So this is an example of uh, cooking sauces and dips that we created for an entrepreneur many, many years back. And she was really up against, you know, the wind greens and the sorceries that you see online that are there on Nature's Basket and other uh, big stores. And uh, she really had to tell a powerful story. And when we spoke with her and interviewed with her, we realized that she was very fond of traveling, her travel inspired her. And through travel, she really brought the local authentic knowledge to create these sauces and dips. And that really ensured that the taste was as authentic as possible. And we said, let's tell that story, the story of being true to origin. So if it is Mexican salsa, it's made really the way you would have it maybe in Mexico City, or if you are thinking of hummus, this is really true to origin. And that idea of true to origin inspired the execution, the design, and the communication. Let me show that to you. was really the story about being true to origin and how that story was really brought to life. This actually went on and won some really cool awards when we launched it and that was quite exciting for all of us as a team. Less is the story of a wine lover. Um, here's another video that I'll play for you. Um, again, a great way of thinking about your category very differently. Uh, this was uh, work that we did for a wine brand, and we really turned things around in terms of how people think about wine and how one can think about it differently. He wanted to make good wine affordable for all. His idea was simple, remove the superfluous and keep the essential. By selling his wine in bulk, our clients aim to reinvent the customer experience, inviting shoppers to fill their less bottles directly from wooden casks at his shop. We created a minimalist identity to support the client's goals. Although it is simple, it quietly communicates the brand's desire to provide only what is necessary. The mark has a special quality. It exists in the negative space. It is either sandblasted on bottles or cut out on recycled paper, meaning it only appears by removing material. The packaging experience becomes bespoke with the purchase of the unique dropped gift bottle, whose label is customized by a drop of the wine it contains. Removing the superfluous goes beyond aesthetics. Less is a truly eco-friendly wine. The brand reduced its carbon footprint by changing customer behavior. When a bottle is reused, much less packaging goes to waste. Additionally, Les uses recycled material, works with local craftsmen, cuts ink by stencil spraying wine whenever possible, and using pigments developed from wine, and minimizes sulfites for a luscious organic product. Les's innovations mean wine that would normally retail for 15 euros can now be sold for five. And that's what Les is all about. A luxurious wine made affordable by changing the rules of the game and challenging the standards of the wine industry. You know, I particularly like this case study really because uh, the client was willing to go against the grain and do something that no one had done before. 
it really takes a lot of courage to be able to do that and that really is going to be my next principle so good design is about telling a fabulous story and the last thing in terms of fundamentals of good design is to have the courage and this is probably the hardest part of uh, working in brand and design consulting you know your clients will be with you on board when you have the insight the perception the ideas the story it finally comes down to execution and this is where your skills in conviction persistence selling really comes into play creativity actually thrives when you have the courage if you take a very safe approach creativity is going to be average probably not very fresh so it's very important to celebrate courage to give the freedom that people need to actually create something very unique and different imagine if my fika client said that oh my god this is so provocative there is going to be a backlash i'm not going to do it let's just talk about how good tasting our coffee is um, and had they done that they would have probably just had another me too coffee brand so creativity really goes hand in hand with courage and if you don't have the courage you're not going to be able to create marriage uh, uh, success and magic one of the things that you know we hear very often in uh, presentations when we are making to the board when you're rebranding big iconic legacy brands they're like oh my god we don't want to be like tropicana now this is a case study from a couple of years back when tropicana refreshed and what you see on the right hand side was the pack they had on shelves for a very brief while and it bombed it failed people absolutely refused to take it on they wanted the old pack back and a lot of people lost their jobs a lot of losses were made so everyone's very scared people want to make safe choices they want to make sure that you don't derail customer needs your stakeholder needs are met but this is where you have to think about the right solutions you need to be able to test you need to be able to convince your client another example is when we worked with mother dairy uh, dahi in india they wanted to do a refresh they had become old school fadi dadi it was my mother's brand no one really cared about it and through all our research and through all our ideation we really wanted to shift the way packaging was done when you think of packaging you will usually see blue you will see yellow you see a spoon of dahi on most of your packaging to convey how tasty it is and we said we are not going to do that we are going to do this very differently and we thought about the benefits of dahi how the regular dahi is used in the kitchen for multi purpose requirements you use it for cooking you use it to serve it's in the middle of your plate it's on the side of your plate depending on which region you are in but that's what classic dahi became for us it was this multi purpose dahi that you buy every day the ultimate dahi was really about celebration it's more indulgent it's rich it's really made the way it was made in early days and advanced dahi was really about protecting your family and this was a massive shift for a client like mother dairy who are very old school but we tested we checked with consumers we did iterations and then we launched it and as soon as they launched the shelf uptake was so massive that mother dairy wasn't able to keep peace pace with it because they actually thought that it's not going to be that successful so guys what i really want to say is good design requires courage but we should not also be foolish about our courage the courage needs to come from a place of insight and knowledge and expertise don't be emotionally uh, swayed there has to be a basis for the courage so that really summarizes the principles of good design it really starts with insight and then it moves on to creativity ideas story and courage design is really the silent ambassador of your brand when no one is there to tell you about the product or the brand when you're experiencing it that's really design at play whether you're walking to a hotel 
whether you walk into a bank, whether you buy a product, whether you shop online, the experience that you have is designed really at play. And like I said, strong brands invest in design, they beat the index, and that's really the end of our discussion. Well on time, 12 o'clock. Oh, I... I'm going to stop sharing my screen if that's okay, so that I can see all of you and we can have a discussion. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you so much. This is amazing. I feel like, especially that Fika ad is going to run on my mind for at least a week right now. Uh, I, most of the ads are nice, but Fika is something uh, that I resonated a lot with. It was great. Don't know if I should be saying this on a call that is getting recorded. But uh, yeah, I said what I said. And now um, I think my friends are super eager to talk to you. So without further ado, I'd like to call upon Muskan Kismani to felicitate the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you very much, Mansi. Uh, and thank you so much, Ronita, ma'am, for joining us at, you know, this kind of fireside chat on understanding the impact the brand has, you know, on business performance and how brands are looked at beyond just advertising, but also as a strategic tool to create competitive advantage. It was a very valuable lesson for all of us, I'm sure. And, you know, this is something that we've been learning every day, how to create value, how to innovate, you know, so and that ad of uh, wait tea, I'm definitely I cannot wait to have my perfect cup of tea right after this session now. <laughs> So thank you so much for that. And it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, I think this is really exciting for all of us, and especially me to have a direct conversation with uh, you in such kind of a setting. So I mean, who better than a person with more than a decade experience in branding company, and who has a commendable history of uh, working with iconic brands. So I mean, we couldn't think of someone better to kick off this chat and gain wonderful insights on good designs for good business. So it's a pretty informal environment. Uh, we have our faculty and other Atlas students who I'm very sure they're pretty much excited and in line to ask you their questions. So to begin with, I would like to call upon Ms. Uh, Ria Samson, who is our MBA media and communication student uh, to ask her very first question. Over to you, Ria. Hello, ma'am. I'm Ria Samson. It was a pleasure listening to you speak. The ideas were amazing and uh, the creativity really inspired me. I just had one question for you for now. Uh, what is that one thing that you learned uh, or will always remember from a decade of your work experience at Landor and Fitch? Um, stay curious. Never assume you know everything. Never uh, take for granted the knowledge and the expertise that you have. We are in a very, very dynamic uh, environment. Things are changing every second. So what you assumed was the holy truth may not be the holy truth. You know, the pan think about the pandemic and how that's changed everything as far as retail is concerned, as far as online payments is concerned. I still remember even up to three years back, I did not have Google Pay, I did not have PayPal, Pay, pay Me, whatever those payment platforms are, but I was compelled to get onto those uh, because of COVID. So never assume what you know is the holy truth and uh, stay agile and uh, be curious. Thank you very much, ma'am. Absolutely, ma'am. That is actually one thing that no matter whatever field you pursue your career in, but curiosity is something that has to be there at every stage. So uh, moving on to the next question, which is a very interesting one. Uh, I would like to call upon Ms. Uh, Shreya Bhalinge, who is our MBA student, to ask her question. Over to you, Shreya. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am, again. Uh, so when you covered a few fundamentals like idea, perception, and insights, you did mention about creative thinking, uh, thinking something very distinct, uh, you know, changing the whole perception of seeing a product. Now, we all know that. And we are simultaneously working on different projects when we are in a design industry. So how one should map their thinking uh, for different types of products from different industries? How can we you know, become efficient in thinking is my question. That is my first part of question. And uh, 
after you answer that, I would like to ask you a, a follow-up question on that. Well, I don't, I don't know if there is a very straight answer to that. Um, it's uh, in in terms of efficiency, a resist copy pasting. That's number one. Um, you have to roll up your sleeves and get in the shoes of the consumer. So you know, uh, in in terms of you know, when I think of my everyday work. I may start my day uh, on a brief for a fashion brand where you're really thinking about the modern Indian woman and her association with fashion. And through the course of the day, I may move to baby products where you want to now think about a young mother. And then I might move to um, alcohol where you're thinking about the 25 year old guy. And then I may end my day with banking where you're thinking about a 60 year old man. So there's absolutely no room for copy pasting. Um, you have to be very alert and you owe it to yourself and your clients to uh, think with empathy and to really think about the customer. So I don't think there's a straight answer to this, quite honestly. I don't think there's a formula for this as long as you are self-aware, uh, as long as you know that you're doing right by your clients and your customers. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I think uh, when you were, uh, you know, uh giving the presentation i think most of my questions were answered there uh that was i think my key learning uh about uh, creative thinking and how to you know get into shoes of customer and think from his point of view also when it comes to design uh there are a lot of things that you have to consider the product the main product the packaging of the product the delivery of the product uh, on uh, social media on digital platforms what part of design process does the team spend most time on I don't think there's a mathematical formula for that either. Um, there's a lot of time that is spent on really understanding the why of the brief. Very often clients come to you and say that I'm losing market share, so can you change the packaging? And uh, the truth be told, that's never the brief. You know, you can't change the packaging because you're losing market share. You have to change the packaging because consumers don't connect with you anymore. Maybe your brand is not as relevant. Maybe uh, your product offering has lost uh, the zing that it had earlier. So there is a lot of time spent on uh, deconstructing the brief, really understanding uh, the objective of any exercise or any assignment that's given to you. Uh, so that's really what we call uh, immersion and analysis understanding every aspect of the brand. And, you know, we have something called the 4C process where you think through the larger context, you think about the company and what they bring to the table, you think about the category, you think about the customer. They're all very, very important. And it's only from there you're able to make that leap to insights and ideas and then creative development. So we have multifunctional teams, we have strategists, we have researchers, and we have designers on board. It's a very collaborative exercise that happens from the beginning to the end. The first part is driven by a strategist, the design is driven by the design team, but there's always collaboration. And you can't compromise one step for the other because they all require uh, the right amount of time and they all require the right amount of thinking. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you, Shreya. Oh, by, by the way, just, just one more thing. Yes, um, and, and this is something that I've experienced. Very often people get very excited with the ideas. They get very excited with uh, the creatives that you come up with. The client is super excited and happy. And then you lose interest because you are moving to the next project. But I want to say that execution is very, very important. It can make or break things for you. And we always say it's 10% strategy and it's 90% execution. So um, I would say, you know, if I were to answer your question differently, execution is where you should spend the maximum time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I think the last part that you just explained, uh, I think, gave me some clarity on why I asked that question. Thank mm -hmm. you, ma'am.
Okay. That's long. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Oh, very well spoken, ma'am. And definitely execution is very, very important. And it can definitely make or break the situation. So uh, another question that we have is from Mr. Parth uh, Shivkani, who is our MBA Media and Communication student. Now, it is a very important question and is something that all the companies are talking about nowadays. So over to you, Parth, for your question. Yeah, so ma'am, uh, what a great lecture on the insights of sustainable thinking and design thinking on that matter. So as ma'am, you explained the concept of the wine or uh, wine, the wine company taking the sustainable design initiative. So I had a similar question on that. There's an increasing awareness about e ESG, the environmental social governance. So and the international brands are getting a lot of recognition on their aspects and what they are, what journey have they taken for this? So do you think Indian Indian brand should also take similar initiatives to, you know, put their story about put the story out about their ESG uh, uh, story, basically. ESG timeline, story line. Yeah. Yes, uh, Parth, uh, Indian brands must do it. And in a way, a lot of them are already doing it. I think what's very important is to be able to tell your story through the lens of your brand. Don't do uh, less plastic because it's mandated by the government. Don't do uh, less carbon footprint because that's what the customer expects because that's very generic, all right? Uh, do it through the lens of the brand and you, you, you will start to see that in a lot of the consumer brands that are launching now, D2C brands, where their ESG commitment is baked into the brand and the brand promise. So for example, um, there's this brand called Fable Street. Um, it is a clothing fashion brand for women. It's all about uh, inclusivity in a way, if you will, because they believe in celebrating all shapes and sizes of women. They uh, employ women to stitch your clothes, to uh, design your clothes, and it's a very seamless process. So it's and that is uh, about inclusivity. That's really about being more ESG compliant in a way. You are thinking of diversity and inclusion and it's baked into their brand. So it's not like, hey, I make great clothes and by the way, I'm planting 10 trees on the side for you. It's part of your brand story and narrative, which is very, very important uh, for all brands to think about and consider because in the long run, that's also what's going to set you apart. If everyone just said 10% less uh, plastic and everyone said that I'm planting trees for you, which brand would you choose? If you really bake in your commitment as part of your brand, as part of your brand experience, that's what's going to make you very unique. And brands are doing that in India already. In fact, investors are investing in brands that are actually making very focused efforts in doing the right thing. There are so many food brands now, D2C food brands that are sourcing directly from the farmer. They're making healthy packaged food for you and you are able to buy it online. That is also ESG. Correct, ma'am. Thank you so much. So I had a similar question. So like, as you said, that like the brands are doing such stuff. So should we as a brand or managers facilitate in telling and promoting these ESG story storylines for our clients, basically? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But tell a story in a way so that it's uniquely yours. Like I was saying, if you are a brand and if you are doing something about sustainability, don't do it as a tick in the box because the customer won't care. So if you're selling toothpaste and if you just say that, you know, buy my toothpaste because I'm ESG compliant, I'm planting trees and I'm using 10% less, um, you know, plastic, I may or may not uh, really decide to buy your brand. However, if you really think through ESG and bake it in your you know, product offering and say, hey, I've created this toothpaste, which requires less water. Uh, you're able to brush and rinse with half the amount of water that's needed. And by the way, not a toothpaste brand, but Ariel, who we work with, has done that. 
they have you know uh, less water washing they have cold washes they are thinking of re-looking at their brand at their product experience to make it more esg compliant and then it becomes more ownable so you know it's aerial you know it's aerial cold wash you know it's aerial concentrate which requires less water and you want to buy that brand versus someone coming and saying that buy my brand and i'll buy a uh, plant and trees for you good well enough thank you thank you so much for the insights thank you Thank you. Thank you, Parth, for asking this question. It was uh, very insightful. Uh, we have a few more questions and then we will quickly move on to the summary of the session. Uh, so this question is from Mr. Rayon Stanley, who is our MBA student. And uh, uh, Rayon, over to you. Yeah, so it was a really an insightful session. Man. And I really like that line when you said that never fall in love with the first idea. Uh, so I had a, a relatable question with, for about that. So how has automation transformed the idea creation? It might have changed the idea execution, but how has it changed the idea creation from the initial stage? Sorry, you'll have to repeat that question and explain it to me. Tell me more. Tell me what you're really thinking. Yeah, so uh, automation and technological development has changed the execution of ideas, right? Uh, from print media to the digital world. But I wanted to know, has it changed the creation of ideas? Means the stages when you decide about an idea, about those. Uh, yes and no, I would say. Um, I, I still think that AI cannot completely replace human creativity. Yes, AI right now is writing songs for rock stars and rap stars, and you, AI can also create painting for you, but there's still an element of uh, unique human creativity that cannot be replaced by AI or automation. But um, don't look at them as the enemy in the picture. Think of them as uh, additional support. So if you're able to use AI to go through tons of data to identify some key trends, emerging themes, you can really take that forward uh, and think about your brand and ideas differently. So are they helping? Yes. Uh, they actually help a lot in terms of execution through 3D printing. You know, you can actually do very rapid prototyping. It's very helpful. At the ideation stage also, they can help in terms of uh, data sourcing, uh, analysis, but um, in terms of finally arriving at the idea, you still need that, um, you know, that, that human uh, influence, I would say. Did that answer your question, Rion? Yeah, it's yeah. a very unique question. I've never <laughs> thought about it, but I don't know if that helps. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am, it answers my question. Uh -huh. So human touch is really important for any idea. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, this was a couple of years back. Um, and Ariana Huffington was actually at uh, ISDI and she gave a talk uh, about, you know, the future workforce and, um, you know, AI coming into the picture. And while AI is going to be able to do a lot, um, and I think that'll be good in terms of support, but Ariana had said, you know, when it comes to creativity, when it comes to empathy, when it comes to final decision making, there still has to be that human uh, intervention. Yes, ma'am, definitely. I, I completely agree to that because uh, human touch is definitely important. That's where behavior science comes into the picture. Uh, and uh, so to uh, one last question from Mr. Yash Arekar. Uh, this is a very exciting one. Uh, and he's a, again, a MBA media and communication student. So over to you, Yash. Hello, ma'am. So I think we've got a lot of points where, you know, being relevant with time and being curious, being inquisitive. So now metaverse is a lot in communication and a lot of businesses are shifting towards metaverse. So the idea of designing and the four piece of marketing that we all are familiar with are now completely changing. 
so ads and marketing how do you think that fit into the metaverse moving ahead you know quite honestly yash um metaverse is another medium the way we look at it and the way we understand we we are creating another channel for your brands to exist in another channel for your brands to connect uh, and communicate with the end customer but the way you build a brand the way you create a brand the principles are still going to be the same even for your brand to stand out and shine in the metaverse you still need that insight you still need that story you still need the courage to push ahead how it appears in the metaverse may change and those shifts happen all the time so even until let's say 5 years back every time we created packaging design the focus used to be that it needs to stand out on the retail shelf in the indian kirana with very little light your brand needs to stand out and uh, be the most unique and differentiated over the years that has changed where now clients tell us that it's not just the shelf where my brand packaging has to stand out even when people are looking on instagram and when people are looking at amazon and big basket in that little tiny little you know uh, picture that you have my brand needs to stand out so the shelf has changed from a retail shelf it's now a digital shelf and now from a digital shelf you're thinking of a metaverse so it's really a different medium or a channel if you will but the principles of brand building are going to stay the same yes correct what is that thank you so much Absolutely, ma'am. And so, with this, we come to an end of our Q and A session. Now, before I hand it over to Mansi, thank you so much, ma'am, for a captivating conversation. Uh, we learned a lot from you, and with the help of those examples and case studies, I'm sure all of us will remember those five fundamentals of a good design, definitely. And it was so fascinating that time just flew by. And now, I would like to call upon Mansi Mishra to summarize the session. Yes. Uh, over to Mansi, but Mansi doesn't know what to say. Everybody is praised. Uh, Ronita, I'm already so much. Uh, but yeah, I agree to everyone. Um, Ma'am, I myself am from Media Communication School, and uh, learning about insights and design is something that we've been doing since two trimesters. But this session has uh, propelled us to a new direction. Now I think we are looking at things a little differently. and i can say this is the first time i'm very glad i woke up uh, early on a saturday morning wouldn't have done this for any other session uh thanks a lot i am here to uh, i really wanted to say a lot many things but uh, prachi ma'am uh, said most of it uh thank you so much for making my job easier ma'am and thanks a lot ronita ma'am for being here i look forward to seeing you in person and learning more from you amazing i'm really happy to hear that uh thank you so much for giving me the opportunity thank you for being such a wonderful audience and keeping pace with me um i really had a very very good time it's a great way for me to um you know just connect with all of you and also understand uh what all of you are thinking um you know metaverse is something that you know we have been fiercely debating um you know in our studio and we've been thinking about you know what this means the future i think it's still very early days but uh, must keep a close eye on that so this was a uh, very exciting for me as well so thank you very very much and i hope all of you have a fantastic weekend i hope you are able to relax and rest but please do make some time to feed yourself with some uh, good inspiration like they say garbage in garbage out so take a walk read a book watch something good on television um write write down journaling is very uh, helpful when you're trying to uh, think of ideas and insights do whatever makes you happy and stay safe guys thank you so much ronita can we take a quick uh, screenshot someone